So praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles tonight and we're going to turn to two places this evening. Over to Ephesians chapter 6 first. And then we're going to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read one verse in each. If you don't want to turn too much, you can listen to me and trust that I'll read you the right verse. I am reading out of King James Bible, by the way, so that'll help you. But Ephesians chapter 6, I'm preaching a sermon that tonight called Know Your Enemy. Know Your Enemy. All right, Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we're going to turn over to 2 Corinthians 2.11. It says there, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you be with me tonight as I stand before your congregation. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to stand in the power of the Spirit of God, and I pray that you'd direct me in where this sermon should go. Lord, if there's things I should not say that I planned on saying, Lord, I pray that you'd withhold that from my lips. And Lord, I pray if there's things that I should say, Lord, I've not planned on, I pray that I'd say them on, Lord. And I just want to be in your hand, Lord, and I want you to use me. Lord, I pray that you'd take the message preached and apply it to the hearts of each and every person here where they have need. And Lord, all of us are probably in a different place in our walk with you, but you know exactly what we need and you know what we need to work on. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here who needs to know you as their personal Savior, I pray that today would be that day of salvation for them. I pray, Lord, that you'd shatter any uh, delusions or false hope they may have and show them that the only way to get to heaven is through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name we pray, amen and amen. Now, you may not realize this, but there's a battle raging around every single one of us every single day of your life. And it is a spiritual battle that is raging. I mean, in a physical battle, it's a lot easier to see your enemies. It's a lot easier to know what their tactics are and what they are doing. But in this spiritual battle, it's not always that easy to know where the attacks are coming from. If you were in a, a physical battle, you would know that you need to fortify your position. You would know where to put your watchmen. You would know where to put your uh, machine gunners and all that sort of thing. But in this spiritual battle, a lot of times you get hit from out of the blue in different places. So, uh, for example, let me, let me illustrate this in a spiritual battle. Now, the king of Assyria, the king of Syria sent a great host to Dothan and, uh, because Elijah... I mean, Elisha, I always get them two mixed up, but Elisha uh, tells Israel about Syria's plans because the Lord had let him in on it. The king of Syria sent this great host to Dothan uh, to try to intimidate the prophet of God or even try to kill him for that matter. And Elijah's, Elisha's servant, Gehazi, I believe that was his name, got all nervous when he saw the host of the Syrians encamped around him and his master Elisha. And he says, alas, master, what shall we do? As he looks out on this army that's going to come destroy two of them. And I like what Elisha did. He said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that are with them. Amen. And he says, I pray that you open his eyes. And the Bible says that God opened Gehazi the servant's eyes, and he saw that the mountainside was full of horses and chariots of fire all around them. Amen. There was a host there with them that they could not see with their eyes of flesh. There was a spiritual army there. And of course the captain of the Lord's host is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who promised never to leave us nor forsake us. So sometimes things look desperate to us when we're looking through our eyes of flesh. But what you realize is that the God of heaven is on your side. And the Bible says you are more than conquerors through him that loved you. So any battle that you face, spiritually speaking, you can win that battle through the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise you, you can. And the devil's going to assault you and he's going to assail you. And I tell you what, he, he's, a, he's a very uh, slimy individual when it comes to attacking. He likes to attack you from the back. He likes to come at you when you're not expecting it with a sucker punch. But I tell you what, you can always win those battles through the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be more than a conqueror through Him. We're living in a spiritual warfare. I tell you right now, our children today are being besieged by this evil one, the devil. We shouldn't be aware, we should be aware of his devices. 
He's trying to turn our children's hearts away from Him. He's trying to do it through the music they listen to. He's trying to do it through the TV shows that they watch. He's trying to do it through YouTube and other things like that, which I believe are, are valuable tools if He used them right, but the devil's going to use them against your children. Send them off to school. I can guarantee you there's going to be some bad influences there. And your children are fighting a spiritual warfare. You need to get down on your knees and pray for them every single day that they can have the strength that they need. Amen. That the Lord would strengthen the weak spots they have in their fortification, which is their, their, their body, soul, and spirit. There's a spiritual warfare out there, folks. I think about Abraham. I didn't plan on saying this, but Abraham made a sacrifice to the Lord. And after he had cut up the pieces of those sacrifices and laid them upon the altar, the Bible says the fowls came down and tried to land upon those sacrifices. You know what old Abraham did? He went out there and he shooed the fowls away, the Bible says. He drove them away. That was given to the Lord. Those fowls should not defile that sacrifice with their nasty beaks or their nasty talons. He, flew, he, he shooed them away. Well, I tell you this, our children are living sacrifices unto God. We are living sacrifices to God. And when the wicked one, those fowls, try to come down and land upon those sacrifices and spoil them, we need to shoo them away. Amen. Some teacher comes to your kid telling them that they evolved from a monkey. You need to shoo that old buzzard away. Amen. Amen. If some friend comes and tries to corrupt your child, you need to shoo that buzzard away. We're living in dangerous times, folks. When the Bible says that, that perilous times shall come, it's not only talking about perilous for your body, but perilous for the souls of men and women and our children. They're getting attacked from every side. The problem is Christians are oblivious to this warfare. We're oblivious. Our freedom of speech is trying to be taken away right now, and people are oblivious to it and don't care. They want to climb up on a spiritual high horse and say spiritual things, but we need to be in the fray, folks. What we're fighting for is not uh, just a piece of land, but our freedoms themselves. You say, oh, they're just, they're just, they're just uh, stopping him from talking. No, they're going to stop you too. They won't know. They don't know. They don't stop. They just keep on going. You give them an inch, they'll take a foot. Once you give them a foot, they'll take a mile. And that's the way the devil is in all of his minions, folks. So we need to be in the fight. Say amen. Are you with me or are you, are you not? Now, the battle's raging all around us. You can't see it. I would imagine if your spiritual eyes were open right now, you might even see conflicts within this building during sermons. Uh, when uh, the, the Holy Spirit is dealing with a soul, the devil is trying to distract that soul. I can tell you this from experience. There's been times when I've been in a home about to win somebody to the Lord and all of a sudden a phone rings right at the crucial moment. Or somebody comes in. I tell we're fighting in a spiritual warfare. We need to be aware of that. That's why it said in Ephesians 6, 12, which we read, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, not only are we fighting a spiritual warfare here locally, with our children, in their schools, in our, in our personal warfare, I can guarantee you there's some spiritual wickedness in very high places in our country. Not only in our country, but in the countries all across the world. You think it is a, a coincidence that the devil is called the prince of Persia there in the Old Testament? Or he's called the king of Tyre in Ezekiel? He said that his seat in the book of Revelation was in Pergamos. He had a seat, a throne, a dominion. We see references like that all the time. And there is a group of people out there who are trying to bring, uh, uh, bring together those things which would bring the Lord Jesus. And I say even so, Lord Jesus Christ come. But I tell you, I'm going to fight tooth and nail until he takes me home. Now, to fight, you've got to know your adversary. Anybody in here play football for, in high school or college or anything? I played football. I wrestled, did some other things, but... One thing they do in football is this, they go to the film room. I, when, when they were talking about Peyton Manning back in Tennessee's heyday, and I don't, I, I don't know what we got now, we sure don't have no heyday. But, <laughs> but I always heard that Peyton Manning was really studious in the, in the film room. If he was going to play a certain team, he would play a, a film of that team playing and he would look for things. 
He would try to find out what his opponent was doing so he could find vulnerabilities in their defensive schemes and so he could score. What we need to do is get into the spiritual film room, Christians. We need to know what Satan's devices are. We need to know how he is going to attack us. We need to know where our weak spots are so we can shore them up. Don't just go through life haphazardly. You need to walk circumspectly. Walk on purpose. Know what you need to work on. Be watching for the wiles of the devil because he's going to attack. It says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, which we read, it says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I believe it was a while back in college football, there was a team still in the signals uh, there on the sidelines. That got them an advantage, didn't it? They knew what they were going to do. In baseball, as a catcher, I was always taught to hold my glove down to one side when I gave the signal for what pitch was going to come so we didn't want the other team to see what it was. We need uh, to know that he's trying to get an advantage over us and we ought to get the advantage on him. We ought to know what he's going to do. Now, how do we know what the devil's going to do? Well, I think we can learn a lot about what the devil's going to do or what he's been doing by looking at the past. Now, I've said this about God. We know what God's going to do because we can look at what he's done in the past because he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. I'm talking about God. And we know what he said he's going to do, he's going to do. But the devil, he's sly. The devil changes all the time. He changes his tactics. Think about this in the first century church. The devil wants to attack it and destroy it. How does he do that? Well, at first he tried to bring in the Romans and, and the Roman emperors and tried to get them to destroy the church. An outward persecution. And I tell you what, the church suffered much persecution. You ought to read about it. It would do you good. But that didn't work. As the devil tried to stomp the church out by force, it was like stomping a fire. As he stomped the fire, the little embers would go up in the air, they'd spread around, and the church grew. It grew through persecution. So you know what the devil does? He says, that's not working. What do I need to do? And you know, the devil decided he'd start sending people in to infiltrate the church. So that's what we find next. He couldn't stomp it out by force, so he started sending people in. Wolves among the sheep. You'll find that most of the New Testament books were written, in the epistles I'm saying, because false teachers had come in. The book of Galatians was written because Judaizers were creeping into the flock uh, there and trying to teach them that they needed to, to keep the law to be saved. The book of Jude, Jude starts out and says, I wanted to write it to you about uh, the salvation of God, but he said it was more needful for me to write to you to earnestly contend for the faith. And he says people are creeping in unawares. And we find that's where we're at right now. There's a church as a whole. We've got all these uh, false teachers that have crept in. You know there used to be one church? Do you know, did you know that? Jesus didn't establish the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Church of God, uh, this one and that one and this one. He made one church. Why is there so many different ones now? Because the devil's crept in. Amen? Amen. Devil divides. So we need to be aware of that. This device, we see that he likes to creep in. He changed his tactics, didn't he? Now, one of the things that he does, and I said we can look back to the beginning. Let's look back to when he tempted Eve. The first one that got tempted, Eve. There in Genesis, I believe chapter 3, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, the first thing he does when he comes to Eve is he starts to scrutinize God's word. He doesn't flat out deny it. He scrutinizes. He says, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. He puts a question mark in there. There shouldn't be a question mark there. God said, Don't eat of any, don't eat of that, that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. But he puts a question mark on there. You sure that's what he meant? You sure that's what he said? Maybe he said that, but he really didn't really mean it. And that's what the devil does. He attacks God's word. Did he really say that? Did, did, didn't God mean that for just that period of time when it was written down in the Bible? Times have changed. He don't mean that now. Isn't that what the devil does? That's exactly what he does. Oh, oh, oh that, that's in the Old Testament. No, uh, God's the same yesterday, today, forever. What he finds abominable there, he finds abominable here. 
Oh, but it's socially acceptable now. But God's not, it's not acceptable with God. It's not acceptable with God. Oh, it's an alternative lifestyle. That's okay. No, no, the Bible says it's an abomination. Right. Amen. Amen. You say, stop being hateful. No, I want to see everybody saved. I don't care what their sin is. I want them to be saved, but I'm not going to condone it and say it's all right because people have changed, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. People change, but God doesn't. Well, well, uh, they didn't have the things back then that, that we got now. Well, I tell you what, uh, you can make as many excuses as you want. You can rationalize your sin all that you want. But what you need to do is find out what God requires of you in this book and do it. Amen. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do you love God? Don't let the devil uh, speak in your and get you to start scrutinizing the word of God and start uh, trying to change what it means. I mean, it's very clear. The Bible says, I suffer not a woman to teach her usurp authority over the man. And that's all about spiritual matters. Now you tell me how a woman can be a pastor. Huh? Hey, it's very clear. Husband and one wife. Well, it's got quiet in here. You just need to let the Word of God stand. Amen. I can tell you what, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of women that get out preaching a lot of the men that I've heard. But the Bible's very clear and puts restrictions there. And where God puts restrictions, uh, we're not uh, to lift the tape and sneak underneath. Right. Amen. They scrutinize God's word. Then he sets in judgment over God's word. That means he denies it all out. First out, starts out scrutinized, then he denies it. He says uh, there to Eve, there in chapter 3, verse 4, Ye shall not surely die. Whoa. He went from putting a question mark to flat out denial. It's the way it works. He starts out getting you to deny little things. I mean, to, to, to doubt little things. And then he starts getting you to believe the lies. You shall not surely die. He's going to get you to doubt God's word. If he can get his foot in the door and start getting you to doubt uh, some things in the Bible, pretty soon he'll have you doubting all of them. If you start doubting some of the, the lesser things that so far as you think are important, pretty soon you're going to be denying and not believing things that are even more major than that. We need to draw a line in the, stand, the sand, folks. Say we're not going to give the devil an inch. And then you know what the devil does? He stands in, uh, not only stands in judgment of God's word, but he, stop, he tells Eve to stop short. Of what God says. He, he says to Eve, he says, you, God knows that the day you eat of this fruit, you'll be like him. In other words, he's saying God's trying to keep something back from you that you really want. And the whole goal of all this is trying to get you to rebel against what thus saith the Lord is. And where does he start? He starts with God's word. God's trying to keep you from something. It astounds me how lost people uh, think uh, that uh, we as Christians are miserable because we don't get to do what they do. But the truth of the matter is I'm not miserable because I'm not doing the things that they're doing that's making them miserable. Right, amen. If I hear a siren, I don't worry about where I'm at. If I hear a police siren, I'm like, oh no, no. I'm not worried about it. Now, there might be a come time when I have to worry about that because good doing good might be a crime before too long. It already is in a lot of ways. I told you, I, I know, I, I mean, I've not been a drunkard myself, but I've seen the drunkard's lifestyle. I've seen how it destroys homes. I've seen how it brings wreck and ruin. Right. I don't want no part of that. I'm not missing out. The Lord's commandments are not grievous. That's what it says. I love coming to church. Now I'm not telling you I always wake up uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed and raring to go. I might have to drink a little bit of coffee before I come. But I love coming. I love what the church is. And most people that's lost, they say, I don't know how you can go to church every, every Sunday and Sunday night, Wednesday night. I don't know how you can do it. I need my day to sleep in. I tell you what I need. I need to hear from God. Amen. Amen. Devil try to tell you though that God's trying to keep something from you. That what you're doing is not right. That what you're doing is keeping you from having a good time. I don't need to go to a nightclub to have a good time. I don't need to go to a bar to have a good time. I don't need a shot 
a whiskey to calm my nerves. All I need is Christ Jesus alone. Amen. He's the one that giveth peace that passeth all understanding. If you find your courage to get through another day in a bottle, what you'll find is after the effects wear off, those troubles will still there. But once Christ shoulders your burdens, they're there unless you choose to take them back off yourself. But that's the way the devil does. That's his device. He attacks God's word. And you know why so many Christians are falling by the wayside? They don't know what the Word of God says. Many Christians will only come to one service. If you come to one service, you're not getting a whole lot. It takes three really to thrive, like Lee Robertson used to say. Many Christians, the only thing they give is they get spoon-fed during church time. But you know what you all do? You need to go home and read your Bible on your own. Amen. Didn't the Bible say he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? Seek him diligently. You're not seeking him diligently if all you're doing is coming to, to one service or two services a week and getting preached to. Now, that's a good thing. That'll help you. But you need to eat every single day. Spiritual meat is just as important as your physical meat is. How would you feel if you only fed your body one day a week? You, well, what would happen? You'd become weak and anemic. You'd become ineffective. You'd be tired. You'd be weary. If you only ate once a week, I'm sure you probably could survive that way, but I tell you what, you'd be a lesser person for it. But how many Christians try to walk with the Lord on a diet of just one sermon on Sunday morning? Didn't Jesus, when he ta taught the disciples to pray, said, uh, pray this way, give us today our what? Daily bread. That means come get it every day. You need it every single day. You need time with God every day, not just on Sunday. I've told you all this before. Uh, take time out for God. And if you're just super busy, you can still take that time out for God. You say, how can I do that, preacher? Well, turn that television off and, and, and talk to God. Read His Word. If you're in the car, you got time at home, turn that radio off in the car and talk to God while you're driving. Talk to God. Spend some time with Him. Amen. Now, He likes to keep us from God's Word. He likes to keep us from prayer. And I believe those are two of the, the most major things that we need is prayer and the Word of God. But our offensive weapon in this spiritual battle is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 says, The sword of the Spirit. Taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, in the, in the physical realm... They used to use swords for battle. Now we use uh, guns, but back when the Bible was written, they used swords. They didn't have guns yet. I'm sure they'd like to have some, but they didn't. But you'd, in a battle, you'd take this cold piece of steel, and you'd take that cold piece of steel, and you'd thrust it into a living, warm body, and what would it do to that body? It would kill it. Well, in this spiritual conflict... We take the sword of the Spirit, which is quick, which means alive, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We take the sword of the Spirit, we thrust it into one who is dead in their trespasses and sins by preaching the gospel to them. And what happens? When they believe, they become alive. It's the opposite. But what a more wonderful thing. I would rather see people saved than kill them, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you rather see people alive than dead? We have the power to preach the gospel to them. Amen. And notice that too. I remember one time that occurred to me. It says the sword of the what? Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. Now, if you are born again, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Every single one of you. You don't need a second blessing to get the Holy Spirit. Once you are born again, you receive the Spirit of God. You don't have to do anything else to get him. Now, uh, some Christians, they have quieted the Holy Spirit's voice. They have not listened. They have, have, they have uh, uh, vexed him. But the Holy Spirit dwells there. Now, the Holy Spirit needs something to fight with. So what you need to do is get in this Bible so you can give, something to fight, give him something to fight with. Huh? What do you say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I tell you, if you dwell in this book, the Spirit will have what it needs to work in your life. A sword can also be a, a surgical instrument, can it? 
And a lot of people think that that, that verse there about the, the, the two-edged sword is talking about a medical device. I don't know whether it is or not, but it could be used that way. You got some things in your life that need to be cut away. There's some things festering in your life. The Holy Spirit needs the Word of God to be able to cut that away. I mean, if you've got sin coming in your life, you've got to know the knowledge of sin. You need to know what that sin is so the Holy Spirit can deal with you and use that to convict you. Christians don't know enough of the Word of God for the Holy Spirit to be able to affect them and to speak to their hearts a lot of times. Okay, say, say you want to win somebody to the Lord. How are you going to win them to the Lord if you don't know the Scriptures? I mean, you be able to need to be able to lead them in the Word of God and show them that they're a sinner. You need to be able to show them that there's a way of salvation through Christ Jesus alone. And how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to do that with the Word of God. You give the sword to Him so He can plunge it into the one who's dead in their trespasses and sins, and they can be made alive. The sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. This book tells us the way of salvation. Now. You, you went, if you went around asking religious people, and I'll go ahead and say Christians, how to get to heaven, you'd get a lot of different answers depending on what church that person goes to. Or depending on what they were taught as a youngster. But that's not what we need. We don't need what Turner Street Baptist Church teaches, and we don't need what that church teaches or that church teaches, or what Papa over here said or Mamma said over here. We need what thus saith the Lord is. Amen. I want to know what the Bible says about it. And you know what the Bible says about it? We'll turn over to John chapter 14 verse 6. That'll tell you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now how could I use that if I don't know it? If I never read that, how would I know that to say it? We need to equip ourselves, folks, to have that sword ready. You know, the Word of God gives us faith. We have so many Christians who don't have faith because they're not reading the book. You say, increase my faith, Lord. Well, the Lord's done told you how to increase it. And you're not listening to Him. That's the problem. What does it say? How do you increase your faith? Well, Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing how? By the Word of God. You don't have no faith because you're not in this book. You say, Lord, give me more faith. And the Lord says, well, I put it right there in the book. How to do it. How to get more faith. Give me that faith. I can move a mountain with it. Well, read your Bible. This Bible's our guide. And I tell you what, we're in, our world is lost. But we don't need to be lost because we got His Word right here. It's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. The world's getting darker, isn't it? Isn't it getting darker and darker in the world? The clouds of sin have rolled in. The fog of doubt has uh, blinded the ways of men here in this world, uh, but the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. When Satan came to tempt the Savior, how did he combat the, the devil? Now, I know God could have just said, I'm God, and he could have just sent him to hell right there. Doesn't Jesus have all power in heaven and in earth? He does. He could have sent the devil packing really fast. But, the de but he did it in a certain way. And why did he do it in a certain way? You ever thought about that? He did it in a certain way to teach you what you need to do. So he could be an example unto you. Like it says in Peter, that you may walk in his steps. A lot of things Christ did, the, the way he did them, is a, to, to be an example to us. Did Christ really need to be baptized? He, he was baptized to be an example unto us, I believe. So how did he combat the devil when the devil tempted him? Now he's very in a w very weak, uh, weak physically. I mean, he hadn't ate, what was it, is it 30 days? 40 days, 40 days, he hadn't eaten 40 days. He's weak physically. I can't imagine that. I mean, after I don't eat one day, I'm, I'm about shot. But he's very vulnerable, he hadn't eaten 40 days. He's vulnerable in the flesh, he had a body like your body. He was not, he, the Bible says that. But anyways, the devil attacked him and then the way Jesus defeated him was he pulled out the sword of the Spirit. Quoted the Word of God to him. And you know what the devil had to do? The devil had to tuck tail and run because he cannot stand against the sword of the Spirit. He can't stand against it. 
that weapon always puts him to flight. Many years ago, I preached a sermon about the devil. And, I, and, and before I did, the Sunday before, I said, I'm going to tell you next week. Anybody remember that? What color the devil is? And I tell you, that was a very interesting week. Everybody kept calling me or texting me saying, is the devil, is, is, he, is, he, is he green? Is he red? Is he black? Is he white? Everybody kept, nobody ever got their answer right when they was asking me about it either. But you know what color the devil is? He's yellow. Some of y'all probably don't know why I'm talking about, but I used to watch westerns when I was a kid. And when somebody was a coward, uh, they'd always say, oh, so-and-so, he's yellow. And the devil, he's yellow. Once you read the word, once you quote the word of God to him, once you whip out the sword of the spirit, he has to take, tell, and run. That's why it says in James, resist the devil and he shall flee from you. How do you resist? You resist with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All right, another thing the devil does in his devices is he promotes self-will. Rebellion. He tries to get you to deny the word of God, and then he tries to get you to rebel against it. He told Eve, he said, you shall be as gods. In other words, you don't need him anymore once you eat this fruit. Once you disobey him, you won't need him anymore. You'll know good and evil on your own. You won't need him to tell you what you need to do anymore. That's rebellion. And the devil certainly is the ultimate rebel, isn't he? Remember Isaiah 14, listen to this. This is a, a, a writing about the de Lucifer when he fell and he became what we know as the devil. It says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That's where he was to begin with. He's the son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon uh, the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the highest of the clouds and I will be like the most high. But yet thou shalt be brought down to hell in the sides of the pit. He aspired uh, to uh, rebel against God and become God himself. And that's the same thing he's putting into the hearts of men. To get you to set God aside. Ye shall be God's. I've even heard some of these uh, air wolves, as Wayne likes to call them. That's the false teachers on television today, preaching that prosperity gospel and fleecing the, flee the, the flock of God, taking their money and, and, and gainsaying for advantage. Right. Wayne calls them air wolves because they buy their private jets and fly around. And they're wolves in sheep's clothing. I like that, Brother Wayne. I'll never forget that. But anyways, now these false teachers... Uh, Many of them right now are teaching uh, this thing that we're all little Elohims. We're all little gods. Where'd that come, idea come from? Well, you see it there in Genesis chapter 3. You shall be gods. That's what they want to be. Rebel against God. Overthrow God and become God yourself. That's humanism too, by the way. We talked about that a little bit this morning. That's the New Age movement. You'll find that that's behind a lot of this stuff. You shall be as God. That's pride, folks. That's rebelling against God's way. That's rebelling against His Word. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about the Antichrist, and it says that he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. The Antichrist. The Antichrist will be possessed by the devil probably three and a half years into the tribulation period. Isn't that what he probably put into the heart of Cain? You think, think what Cain did was... Kind of influenced by the wicked one and the thoughts there. I mean, he, he tempted Eve and Adam and he tried to get advantage of them, but God found them, came calling for them in the garden. Amen. I like that. As soon as man sinned, God came calling. When they were found that they were naked, God gave them a covering. By the way, the word covering is the word atonement. And that's what Christ does for all those who put their faith in him. But when their first children are born, the devil still attacks, doesn't he? Lays it in the mind. Of course, now Cain and Abel are fallen. They have that fallen nature to, for the devil to work with. But the Lord has shown them how they are to approach him through a sacrifice. But Cain thought it was a good idea to make the works of his own hands his sacrifice. Fruit from a cursed ground, even on top of that. He offers them to God and God says, that's not good enough. That's not what I require. He gave him a second chance. He says, if you'll do right, you'll be accepted. If not, sin lieth by the door. But Cain, what did he do? He rebelled. He wouldn't do it God's way. 
He's going to do it his way or no way at all. And I tell you, there's people today, they won't do it God's way. They got to feel like they got to earn their own salvation. But you got to come God's way. That's the only way to come. Amen. He became a vagabond in the earth because of that. The Tower of Babel, what did they say as they were building that tower unto the heavens? Well, they said, let us build a city and a tower whose hot top may reach the heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. That's pride and rebellion. The devil put that there. He's the ultimate rebel. The parable of the pounds there in Luke chapter 19. Jesus talks about uh, giving the, 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 the pounds to each person. Uh, but he gives another story and another parable there. And he says that, that when the, the householder came down to get what he required, it says that the people said, but the citizens hated him and sent messengers after him saying, we'll not have this man to reign over us. You know who that's talking about? Jesus. They said, we won't have this man to reign over us. The devil's trying to get people to say that today, aren't they? We don't need his word. We don't need his laws. We don't need his restrictions. We'll do what we want to. We'll be our own gods. You know what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4? I mentioned it already. It says in the last days, men's gods will be their own belly. And sure enough, it is. Pride leads to rebellion. You know, I think about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were religious people, weren't they? They did a lot of things right. They memorized scriptures. They prayed three times a day. Most of them fasted twice a week. They did a lot of good things, didn't they? But you know what? They were very prideful. They thought that they could earn their way into heaven by what they did. They, 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 they tried to establish their own righteousness and didn't submit themselves to the righteousness of God, which is by faith, like it says in Romans. They were prideful. They thought they could get it. But you can't do it on your own. No matter how many good works you do, you can't get there on your own. And to try to get there on your own, you're a rebel and you're trying to come in another way. And the Bible says that you're a thief and a robber if you try to do that. Are you a rebel? Uh, I think Rick used to quote this, I believe, uh, over at Dell Insulation. We do safety meetings. He'd talk and he'd try to turn it toward the Bible, which is always a blessing. But uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 23. It says uh, that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is a rebellion against God. And even so, if you don't keep His word here, you're rebel. You want to make a name for yourself? Do you want to just seek a position? Do you do everything based on how it affects you? Or do you do everything how, based upon what God requires? This is one of the devil's oldest devices. Let's get to the last one. He likes to sow discord among the brethren. That's another device he uses. And I tell you, he's getting really good at this one. He's getting really good at this one. This one right here has destroyed a lot of churches. A lot of churches have went down over something very silly. I know of a church, they, they argued and the church split over the color of the carpet. What a bunch of silliness. Say amen. Now, when the devil rebelled, he took a third of the angels with him. How did he do that? He sowed discord, didn't he? When God made all the angels, how did he make them? Their first estate was holiness. They were holy angels. But he sowed discord. The Bible don't give us a whole lot of information on how he did that, but that's what he did. He said, I'll be like the most. I have no doubt he went around uh, to criticizing God and saying that he could do a better job. How else would he have done it? He's a master at it, and he's still at it today. So we're trying to get people to sow discord here among our brethren in our churches today. Right. I believe our church gets along pretty good, but I tell you what, don't ever think that you're above it because at any moment, if you think that you, you're able to withstand him without the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to fall. Right. Now, 2 Timothy 3.8 talks about some rebels. This is, Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Uh, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no farther. Far, farther uh, there shall be, they shall be made manifest unto all men. Now this is talking about wicked people. They're going to uh, try to divide us. They're going to fight against us, but there's many times the devil likes to take those of our own flock and try to divide us. It says among the brethren. That means your brethren, you're supposed to be helping, but you're hindering. 
Uh, even so, as James and Jambres so discord, uh, discord there uh, with, and fought against God, even so do those who so discord here among our people are resisting the truth and corrupting minds. In Numbers chapter 16, there's a great illustration there, chapter 11 or 16, I'm not exactly sure. Didn't write it down, but anyways, there was a man named Korah. Anybody familiar with Korah? Korah was a great instigator. instigator. He was a proud man. He was a man of renown. Everybody knew who Korah was. He's a big man among everybody. And I'm sure he spent a lot of time getting the Israelites to chide against Moses. And he, I tell you what, I don't know how Moses put up with a million and a half of Jews criticizing him all the way from Egypt to, to, to almost in the Kadesh Barnea. The Korah had a big part of it. Now, a Korah said something like this. He said, you take too much upon you. Seeing that the congregation is holy, every one of them and the Lord is among them too. Wherefore, why do you lift yourself up among the congregation? He said, it's a small thing that thou has brought us out from a land that flows. He's calling Egypt a land that flows with milk and honey. He said, you brought us out of the land that flows with milk and honey to kill us here in the wilderness. But then God sees what this man's doing. He's sowing discord. He's talking about the man of God. He's talking about the people of God. He's trying to get people to, to, to fight among themselves. And God says, you need to separate yourselves from the tents of this guy. He tells Moses that. And Moses said, come on out. And you know what God did? God caused the earth to open up and he swallowed up Korah and his company down to the pit. That's what God thinks of sowers of discord among the brethren. Sowing discord among the brethren is a dangerous thing because it, 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 it is, uh, opposes God's will. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse I mean, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. Now, we like to pick our abominations, don't we? But listen to these abominations. A proud look. We done talked about that a little bit, didn't we? A lying tongue. Whoa. That's an abomination. So-and-so ain't here. You just committed an abomination. Hands that shed innocent blood. I tell our nation's full of abominations if you're looking at that one. Over a million and a half babies slain every single year. Just as wicked as those nations in the Old Testament who would offer their, their babies to Moloch, the false god, uh, putting uh, their babies in the, the hands of that, that brazen uh, idol uh, where they would be burned with fire. Uh, the, today, when people commit abortion, they're committing their children to the same false god. Matter of fact, I believe when people do such a heinous thing, they are sacrificing their children to their own selves as their own God because it's out of convenience. Another thing he hates is a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift to mischief. They flock like buzzards to try to stir the pot. Are you a pot stirrer? The Lord thinks that's an abomination. The Lord says that's an abomination. He don't think anything. He calls it what it is. A false witness that speaketh lies. And here's the last one. A sower of discord among the brethren. It's an abomination. A sower of discord among the brethren. If you're somebody always trying to stir the pot, and if you're somebody always putting somebody down over here or over here, you're a sower of discord among the brethren. If you start whispering to somebody else about somebody else there in the congregation, you're a sower of discord among the brethren. No doubt about it. Listen, I mean, uh, how do you sow discord? You do it by your actions. Peter certainly sowed discord among the brethren when he withdrew himself from the Gentiles and Paul called him out on it, didn't he? By your disposition, you can sow discord. Preacher says something, you kind of go, Huh? Or try to do the opposite and make everybody let it known. I don't care what he says, I'm going to do it my way. Well, go ahead and do it your way and be a sower of discord among the brethren. I'm not some dictator here at the church, but I am the man God chose to lead this congregation. And I tell you what, I'm very, I listen to everybody. I try to. And I try to take advice from people. I don't try to be a lord over God's own heritage. But the buck stops with me. You're not going to stand before God over how this church went. But I will. 
And I touch you can talk about me if you want to, but it's only going to hurt you. I don't think anybody here is talking about me. I'm not aiming at nobody. I know, I know some people's wheels start turning and say, who's talking about, who's he talking about? I never preach to people like that. But you know what happens? And so let's, let's take a Sunday school teacher, for example. You, you, you get done with church and you get in the car, you start driving home and your kids are there in your car and you start running down to a Sunday school teacher. How's that kid going to, what's he going to think about his Sunday school teacher with his mom and dad running them down? Is he going to listen to the lesson? Is he going to care about what they say? You're so in discord. Your words. Words are a dangerous thing. Your words, once you fire them off, you can't get them back. Brother Wayne likened them to someone shooting a gun. Once you fire that round, the bullet's gone. And the person that strikes, you can't unstrike them. And that's the way it is with words. You can be forgiven, but it's hard to forget. Words spoke, spoken illy advised. Think about Proverbs. I'm about done. Proverbs 6, 11. It says, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness in his heart. And he devises mischief continually. He soweth discord. Discord among the brethren. God speaks a lot about that. We need to be careful. We don't need to gossip and talk about other people. Say amen. By the way, gossip is not just the woman with a long tongue or the man with a long tongue for that matter, but it's, the, it's also the person that lends an ear to it. See, gossip not only takes lips, it takes ears. They won't, they won't gossip with you if you don't listen. A critical spirit, always criticizing. I could do that better. Well, you may be able to do it better, but that's not the position you're in. Amen. I mean, uh, Brother Rick does a, has been doing a good job leading the singing and leading the choir. Would I do everything the exact same way he does it? No. You think I agree that the way he does everything is the best way to do it? Maybe I disagree. But that's the position I put him in. That's his job. I'm not going to criticize him for it. And I just used him for an illustration because I knew he could take it. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, the, the, don't, you don't have that job. You don't have that responsibility. Why are you putting, uh, putting the person down who was willing to take it up? You wouldn't take it up. I mean, here at church, I mean, we didn't have a song leader. For, I've been in a song leader for a long time. And nobody's talking about it. I'm not talking about Rick because somebody's been talking about him. I'm just using him for an illustration. We didn't have one for a long time. No, nobody wanted to do it. So why would you criticize somebody that actually stood up and done it? If you could play the piano and, 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 and you've been here year after year and Bethany comes up and starts playing the piano, don't say, well, I don't like the way she plays the piano. Well, why didn't you do it? Amen. <laughs> it goes with everything. I don't like the way they teach Sunday school. Why aren't you teaching Sunday school? <sighs> we need to live by Colossians 4, 6. I memorized this verse a long time and the Holy Spirit hits me with it all the time. I tell you, I got cuts, I got scars all over me because the Holy Spirit's cut me with it. It says there, let your speech be all the way with grace. Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Have your speech all the way with grace. What is grace? When it comes to salvation, what's grace? Unmerited favor. You deserve to go to hell forever, but Jesus Christ gave you grace. He gave you what you didn't deserve. Unmerited favor. Well, your speech needs to have unmerited favor too. And I tell you all the time, using our, our words as a club, we ought to use them to lift people up. Amen. Amen. And what's the effects of these devices? Well, here we go. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. It says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. Let's stand in one accord. Let's don't let the devil have an advantage over us. Let's know his devices. Let's walk, watch out for them. Let's stay true to God's word. Let's not sow discord among the brethren. Let's stay true. Let's pray.